let me start this video by saying that I don't hate Damon X Machina. I don't have any strong feelings for or against it. And that's the problem. It's just not doing it for me. Damon X Machina is a 2019 mecha game from Marvelous. It was first released on the Switch, but eventually got a PC port the following year. One of the draws to the game is that it was made by former From Software developers who worked in the Armored Core series. I wanted to play this game because of the art style, and because of this moment that happens near the end of No More Heroes 3. The death cage is going off. It is transferring something over from another dimension. Transferring? Transferring what? Some sort of unknown huge object. Starting countdown. It's not a monster or something, is it? We get one more monster or demon or whatever, and this town is screwed. Yeah, more like this planet! Three, two, one. Here it comes. And this second, the transfer is complete. An Arsenal Rollout model has arrived. What? The mech from Damon X Makina? From the Japanese publisher Marvelous? An Arsenal? Maybe I'm too meta-brained. But taking a mech from a game titled Damon X Machina and putting it in a game where the secret true villain's name is Damon and using that mech to pull a Deus Ex Machina to save Travis was a pretty hype moment at the time. I even double dipped and have a Switch and Steam copy, but I let it follow my backlog because there were other games I wanted to play. Before even looking at DXM, I wanted to make sure I played through an armored core to get a baseline for Japanese mecha gameplay. Then I could move on to other titles after having a reference point. And I'm glad I did that because I got a lot out of my time in EC3. Taking on jobs for various factions, shopping for parts, building a loadout that either I prefer or works best for the given conditions of the current mission, and fighting in the arena to test out my build before doing an actual sortie. EC3 was pretty dry and straightforward when it came to delivering its plot, but I like that because that's what I expect from a corporation offering work to an independent contractor. That's me. As for combat, Look, I'm not going to act like I'm an expert after putting my way through AC3. I got comments telling me I was playing suboptimally by not bunny hopping, and that remapping the controls was a big no-no. I'll straight up admit that I'm a tourist when it comes to the scene. I went back to AC3 and tried to pick up its default controls again. And I kinda got it. I've got this weird muscle memory thing where I tend to lock up my hands, so I keep pressing L1 more than I should, and that causes my AC to keep strafing left. But I get what people say about not being able to schmoof properly if I change the controls. Having said that, I do know the feeling of getting my ass torn apart by a mech, tinkering with my loadout, and getting back into the fight. I know what it feels like to fight for a win. It's important to have that kind of intense feeling in a game, because it gives you the motivation to pick yourself up and try again. It encourages you to look at the problem from a different perspective, and come to a solution you hadn't thought of before taking a couple of L's. I don't get any of that from Damon X Machina. What I do get is not enough customization options for my mech, and too much plot. I'm gonna assume you've seen my Armored Core video, and refer to it from time to time when I explain the differences between AC's and DXM's gameplay and writing. Spoiler, I didn't finish DXM, and I'll get to why I didn't later in the video. Let's we'll start with the similarities between titles. DXM follows the same structure as AC3. You log onto the network to do jobs for mega corporations, buy parts from the shop, customize your AC or arsenal as they're referred to in DXM, and communicate via correspondence with Corpos and other Arsenal pilots, or Ravens. You even have to do a certification test in both games to qualify as working with a Corpos. DXM's test operates as a standard tutorial, but AC3's test is a literal trial by fire. You're not going to make it far in the world if you can't figure out how to work with the default controls. Personally, I don't mind either approach. Obviously, the biggest difference between both games is how to control the mechs. No surprise, I like DXM's controls because they use both sticks to move the arsenal and the camera. They feel more natural to me simply because they've got parity with modern control schemes from other types of games. I like how boosting while touching the ground will cause the arsenal to skate along the surface, and how the boosters are mapped to a different input from the jump jets. I like that arenas provide recovery items and energy sources. Breaking open repair pods creates a healing field that restores your arsenal if it's standing inside the field. I like the density that each arena has in DXM. AC3 has a few interesting spots, but DXM spaces always felt more interesting to explore. I like how destroying enemy arsenals rewards you with spoils if you go to where they fall and scavenge those parts. I like those moments where you can jump out of your arsenal and run around with only a pistol like you're the worst diva player on the team. Those are virtually all the parts I like about DXM. It's all downhill for me after this. One of the major things I noticed about customizing the arsenal is that there's no variety in the actual parts. 
I didn't see any legs that weren't bipedal, and I couldn't see any major differences to the Arsenal silhouette when I swapped out arms or chest parts. Either the shoulders get bulkier, or the surfaces on the actual parts are hard-edged or rounded. Aesthetics aside, there's no way to screw up your build. Picking your legs in AC3 was important, not just because it affected how your AC could move, but because it affected how much weight your AC could carry without expending any energy. Swapping out parts in DXM just works. And while that sounds like a really convenient thing to have, it makes the act of picking parts less meaningful. I'm not building a mech, I'm swapping out the legs of a LEGO figure. And the parts themselves are another issue. Shopping for parts in AC3 feels daunting at first, because everything's labeled like an AMD graphics card, and you're not sure how the stats on the parts will be reflected in-game. But eventually, you get an idea for how each weapon type behaves and whether they interface with your auto-aim system. You gain a preference for tank treads, or reach the final stage of every organism's evolution and become crab. Part speaking in DXM isn't as interesting. That's due to a few factors. First, the shop isn't as well stocked in the beginning as it is in AC3. The game expects you to scavenge parts off of arsenals you beat in the early game. Those parts then become available in the shop. You can also craft new parts if you have enough materials. The problem with this method is that you're getting too many dupes, and the only variances within those dupes are if they deal two more points of damage, and if they got some passive perks or slots available for those perks. It's a case where everything is too granular, to the point where you can't really grasp onto anything meaningful because the sand is too fine and is running through your fingers. And as nice as the controls are in DXM, the combat feels too easy even on normal. Sure, I'd have to scrub a run here and there to get a feel for how my mission plays out, but there's no real sense of urgency in a fight. A lot of that has to do with the fact that moving in the game doesn't feel fast, even when you're schmooving around. It's really easy to zone out in a fight. The boss fights can be pretty cool, but it depends on the boss. The first one you fight left quite the impression on me, and I was hoping that the game would be just more of that. The spider tank boss is also cool, despite that one shield attack that can push you out of bounds. I wanted to like the one flying boss that starts out looking like a battle cruiser, but then opens up into a floating snake. But there were a lot of instances in the fight where it would fly out of my reach and I'd have to wait until it was in range again. As for the writing, I can understand that people consider Armor Core 3's exposition to be stiff and boring. You're getting communique via email and listening to audio briefings to get an idea of how the world works. You don't see any of the people in the game. All you ever see are the ACs those people pilot. What keeps AC3 from getting stale is that there are moments in the campaign that catch you off guard. Objectives change mid-sortie. A new AC pops in, and you gotta fight a threat you weren't expecting when you took on the job. Sometimes a raven who was working with you ends up betraying you, and you gotta put down one of your own. These moments work because they don't happen in every sortie. If a surprise twist kept happening, then it stops becoming a surprise. So about DXM. If you aren't a fan of how Spartan Armored Core is when it comes to exposition, don't worry, you're gonna get all the exposition you could ever want in DXM. You're gonna get the equivalent of your dad finding you smoking his cigs and then forcing you to smoke the entire pack amount of exposition. Unlike Armored Core, you're not a faceless pilot. The first thing you do in the game is customize your character. I like DXM's art style, so I'm cool with this. As you take on jobs, you meet other Arsenal pilots and they'll provide chatter to give you information on the setting and prevent the game from having too much dead air. So far, so good. The chatter makes the world feel alive and personal. Gigant class immortals. So named after the mythological race. Colossal beings born from the blood that fell when the primordial god Uranus was castrated. One could say that in this gigantomachy of our time, we are like unto Zeus, brandishing his mighty thunderbolt. Real wordsmith, this guy. But then you meet more pilots. Like, so many more. And these pilots come from several factions in the game, and they each have their own quirks and backstories. One group is full of condemned criminals who take on jobs who can meet their sentences. One group is full of lilies from Tekken. One group is full of vat-grown orphans who can respawn after death because they got access to those new U machines from Borderlands. This could have been fine, but the problem is that there are way too many pilots and factions to keep track of, and they all got their beefs with other pilots and factions. And these factions are all buying from the same jobs offered by the three corpos. So now you have to mix and match the three corpos and however many factions are on a mission to mission basis to figure out who's fighting who and who's getting backstabbed. DXM's issue is that his plot is focused on two different threats. The rogue machines and the AI network that coordinates all of your operations. 
The machines are the main antagonists for most of the plot. Jobs consist of defending areas from machine attacks, or attacking their territories. This threat is what encourages the various factions to work together for the welfare of humanity. But early on, there are hints that the AI that's supposed to be infallible is in fact fallible, and deliberately putting pilots against each other. To give you an idea of how often this happens, here's a screen cap of my folder containing all the raw gameplay I recorded for DXN. Each video covers a single mission. Now here are all the missions where you end up fighting other pilots. In each of these missions, there's always an exchange between the factions about how they shouldn't be fighting each other because the real threat is the machines. But breaching a contract is bad form in the business, so you still end up fighting those pilots. I'm sure the plot is going somewhere with this, but I was done with the game after having to fight the fifth faction in a row and seeing all the pathos of being forced to fight a fellow pilot. Like, I get it. We should be working together and trying to figure out why the AI is acting up. But no one ever actually collaborates with someone outside of their own faction. I guess it's a sign of how suspicious and untrustworthy everyone is in the setting, but I've seen the same plot point five times by now. So yeah, I dropped the game after killing the orphans and then learning that I didn't actually kill them because ship of Theseus and all of that. Here are my takeaways from the experience. I like how the arsenal controls and how easy it is to see what's going on in a fight, despite how busy the screen can get. The missiles have this cool Geometry Wars look to them that makes them easy to read when they fly out. I like how if you do a melee attack at the same time as an enemy, you can end up clashing and have to mash a button to win the struggle. I like how easy it is to swap the backup weapons. I've never had a moment in either game where I had to dump a weapon or part on the field, but I'm sure it's a useful function. I like having recovery items on the field. I haven't seen another game use a healing field like this since, and I can't believe I found a way to shoehorn this reference in one of my videos. Sin Episodes Emergence. I like being able to scavenge parts off of scrapped enemies. It feels like I'm taking spoils from war. I don't like how customizing my arsenal doesn't feel very involved. I can change its colors and slap on however many decals I like, but my arsenal will always cut the same silhouette. Top heavy, the chicken legs, and those canned coal cannons strapped at the back. And I definitely don't like how the plot feels like it's spinning its wheels for several missions. Having the AI and the machines both be a problem could work if the pool of characters was pared down to like 3 factions and maybe 15 or so pilots. DXM's pilots have a lot of personality and can stand apart from others when they have the spotlight, but eventually they start developing shorthand on pilots based on which faction they're with. Apparently, Damon X Machina is getting a sequel. As much as I'd like to hope that Marvelous built on the game's strengths and improved its weaker points, I'll probably sit this one out. Truth be told, I'm doing this video just so I can make something out of the footage I've recorded and then get it off my hard drive. I may not like this game, but I don't outright hate it. It's just not doing anything for me. I think it's important to have that moment when you're on a treadmill and realize, yeah, I want to get off now. This is me getting off of the treadmill.